Tonight happens to be the 20th anniversary of the Phyllis Clark Memorial Lecture. Uh, in preparing my introduction, I had no idea. Uh, it shows you how attentive uh, I can be. And the lecture was initiated by the Department of Politics and Public Administration uh, here at Ryerson in uh, memory of a former colleague. And uh, but Don Elder, the president of Local 3904, QP 3904, We'll have a, a little bit more to say about, about her and why we have uh, the lecture in, in a minute. Now, <clears throat> our first lecture was held nearly 20 years ago to the day, uh, March 8th, 1989. And it's probably propitious that around that time in 1989, we we're entering uh, into what was then to be a very, very deep, uh, some called it a depression uh, in slow motion, uh, a dramatic decline in the economy. And, and here we find ourselves today, 20 years later, uh, in a very, very similar, uh, if not worse, uh, situation. So it's very appropriate that we have Leo Panitch uh, speaking on, uh, on an alternative perspective, providing an alternative interpretation uh, of those events, or the events that we're living in. Now, I also need to thank uh, the Canadian Union of Public Employees. So in particular, uh, I need to thank uh, the people from our three uh, CUPE locals here at Ryerson and uh, Fred Kahn from CUPE Ontario who, who shepherded the proposal all the way through. And, and uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, I guess I, I, at this point I should turn it over to uh, to Don Elder, who can uh, introduce uh, the lecture itself and, and provide a bit of background about Eparowski, where it comes from. Uh, Don, where are you? Look. Here, sir. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you, Brian. Um, I have a word or two about Phyllis Clark, and um, she joined the Department of Politics at Ryerson in 1977, and she re remained an activist until the end of her life. She was a founding member of the Graduate Assistance Association, which later became the Canadian Union of Educational Workers, and later again amalgamated with the Canadian Union of Public Employees, QP, in 1995. For the union, she undertook one of the first studies in Canada of the unequal place of women faculty members in Canadian universities. And things have not changed much, have they? Hmm. She had the courage to run for Parliament several times, once again John Diefenbaker in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, where she lost, and she also ran against and lost to Walter Gordon, who became a leader in the Lester Pearson government. Among her publications is a book, The Reminiscences of Tim Buck, who was leader of the Communist Party in Canada, which she co-edited with uh, William Beeching. Phyllis Clark died on March 21, 1988, having lived a life devoted to socialism, trade unionism, Feminism, community activism, and teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, now I want to turn it over to uh, Sam Gindin, who will introduce Leo Panitch. And uh, some of you may know, but if you don't, Sam Gindin, in fact, was our guest lecturer uh, back in 2002. Uh, and uh, he and Leo go back, if you can believe it, 48 years. I'm 48 years old. That's a, a long time. Uh, so it's quite the uh, uh, enduring relationship, uh, intellectual relationship, political relationship uh, that they've had. Thanks, Brian. Uh, at an international academic conference, a rather famous political scientist was overheard saying that there were only two people that he was afraid of debating, Leo Panitch and his mother. <laughs> A short time after apartheid's fall, Leo and I arrive in South Africa for discussions with the, and educational work with the South African metal workers. A car meets us at the airport after a 24-hour flight and whisks us immediately to a meeting. The various factions of the South African left are at that moment trying to hammer out a measure of unity. As we approach the meeting place, someone is nervously pacing outside. In a flash, he's at the car doors, 
yanking one open and frantically demanding, quick, you must come in. There's a furious debate going on between two groups on the role of the state, and both sides are quoting Leo Panitch. <laughs> as respected as Leo is in the academic world for his writings and achievements uh, around the development of a theory of the state, and as much as his tall shadow and strong positions bring fear to some in academe, what is ultimately much more significant is Leo's relationship to those in direct struggles. Leo is an intellectual relevant to, engaged by, and regularly invited into discussions by those in struggle on every continent, from South African workers to Latin American campesinos to socialist groupings in Europe. One of the places Leo was uh, invited to some time back was the Canadian Auto Workers Luxurious Education Centre on Lake Huron. He'd been asked to talk about the history of working class organizations. He's introduced, uh, but hesitates before speaking. He takes in the broad wooden beams, looks up at the impressive skylights, and then returns his gaze to the audience. With an impish smile, the professor from Toronto declares, nothing's too good for the workers, eh? There's an uneasy shuffling of chairs. A few of the workers turn their eyes to me, their raised eyebrows asking why I brought this cheeky guest to their center. Others distance themselves by folding their arms across their chests. By the time Leo's finished speaking, the arms are uncrossed. The arms are excitedly scribbling snatches of his talk or propping up pensive faces. They get it. Panitch is not a guest. He's one of them, challenging them to challenge themselves. The worker students may not fully grasp everything Leo spoke about, but they're exhilarated to regain some of their lost history and to participate in a discussion of the big issues of the times. It's Leo at his best, an intellectual who refuses to patronize the working class by romanticizing it or catering to it, because he respects their realities, contradictions, and potentials. The present crisis seems to have made Marxism more broadly relevant relevant again, and Leo will speak to this. What I want to add, however, is that for Leo, Marxism never had all the answers. It was never about, in Gramsci's words, quote, reducing a conception of the world to a mechanical formula which gives the impression of holding all of history in its pocket. But neither had Marxism ever lost its relevancy. Marxism was an intellectual starting point, a touchstone with which to answer the question Peggy Lee raised in song when she asked, is that all there is? Leo's Marxism is, I think, ultimately driven not just by the analytical, but perhaps ironically and even heretically for a Marxist, what amounts to a stubborn faith in something that is not necessarily inevitable and whose possibility even remains problematic, an egalitarian, solidaristic, fully democratic and culturally rich world, the social manifestation of which we call socialism. Leo's great contribution as an intellectual has rested, I think, on this non-intellectual insistence, as Phyllis Clark insisted, that there is really nothing else to do but to act as if the craziness of capitalism is not all there is. When Brian contacted me about doing the intro for Leo, our family had just rewatched The Pirates of Penzance. I took the timing of this invitation as a sign and decided to add a brief Gilbert and Sullivan-esque conclusion. It's called The Very Model of a Public Intellectual. <laughs> Bear with me. No, I, I'm not, don't, don't worry, David, I'm not saying <laughs> With Miliband, Poulancis, and those erstwhile Marxists radical, our Panish quick disposed of theory that was only fatical, rejected the myopical, or solace in the cynical, and cast off our reliance on belief Apocryphilical. <laughs> Though capital is to be read with sympathetic piety, analysis demands of us abstemious sobriety. The genius of Marx was not that of a Delphic oracle, but offering the clues of class, state, and the material historical. <laughs> Revolutionary theory is indubitably logical, yet theory dies a lonely death 
it is not pedagogical. And practice, unlike theory, does not come without sabbatical. To tie theory, learning, doing for Leo is thus emphatical. Socialism is at best a distant actuality. The dream of transformation lives beyond our brief mortality. And so what lies behind the breath of Leo's great accomplishments is his conviction that he lived the future in the present tense. Scholar, teacher, activist, and comrade with a life that's full, I introduce to you the very model of a public intellectual. <laughs> I think Ginden missed his calling. <laughs> well, uh, well, I'm very honored to be giving this lecture tonight. And I want to thank Brian uh, Evans in particular for persisting in trying to find a time that would uh, work out for me to give the lecture for his obviously very hard work uh, in organizing this very hard, uh, large turnout uh, and for the work he did with TVO. Uh, in arranging for this broadcast. I knew Phyllis Clark uh, as one of the leading members of Ryerson's political science department, and I admired her role as a Communist Party activist and intellectual. Although I often disagreed strongly with the theoretical line and the political practice of the Canadian Communist Party, I admired Phyllis's organizational commitment and her utter lack of careerism and opportunism. Whatever may have been the case in the USSR, no one here joined the Communist Party, or as in Phyllis's case, given her family's political roots, stayed with the party for careerist reasons. Her, defeat, her, her dedicated commitment to the hard political work of social justice was always clear, and I can still see her at political meetings in her last infirm years, looking more and more like Jean-Paul Sartre as she puffed away on her cigarette while schlepping around her portable oxygen tank. Now that took stubborn willpower. I must say that the title, Still a Marxist After All, first suggested to me for this lecture, actually what was originally suggested, was despite everything, still a Marxist after all these years. This was not Brian's suggestion, I hasten that. Which I rejected because it made me feel both old and stupid at the same time. <laughs> I had the sense that the title was intended to showcase my own irrational, stubborn political willpower. After the collapse of communist regimes and parties, after the global triumph of capitalism, after trade unionists in so many countries started paying more attention to the stock markets their pensions were invested in than the defeat of their, of their unions, after the intellectual embrace of post-structuralism, post-modernism, neoliberalism, and the human rights imperialism of the new American empire by so many of the nouveau philosophes of the 68 generation. After Bob Ray, fresh from his disastrous turn as Ontario Premier, and in the course of making his peace with the Canadian ruling class, wrote a review of a biography of Marx in the Globe and Mail that declared the world would have been much better if Marx had never lived. Well, to be still a Marxist after all that, really did suggest the same kind of stubborn willpower shown by those who refused to quit smoking in the face of all the pressure to stop. Presumably, this deserved enough grudging admiration to be featured on TVO's Big Ideas series. <laughs> well, events have conspired to change the scenario a little. As the current crisis of capitalism has unfolded, Marxism almost appears to have become the flavor of the month. At the very least, to be criticized for being a Marxist today puts me in excellent company. There was nothing more pleasurable for me during the recent US election campaign than seeing Obama elected, despite the right-wing media calling him a socialist. One of them even went so far as to quote from Marx on from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs, and then asked Joe Biden whether Obama's promise to spread the wealth around a little didn't make him a Marxist. I loved it, although what was rather less pleasurable was Biden's responding to this question with sheer incredulity and then outrage. What may be especially significant about the outcome of the election in the United States is that most American voters didn't respond with such shock and horror to Obama being called a socialist or even a Marxist. 
And when the day comes that they don't just shrug their shoulders at indifference at such charges, but actually see this designation as a positive one, we should have really gotten somewhere. But elsewhere, there almost seems to be an enthusiastic embrace of Marx. Sales of Das Kapital have shot up amidst the current economic crisis. In Germany, where only 100 copies of Das Kapital were sold in 2007, well over 2,500 were sold in 2008. My own little book, Renewing Socialism, published in its second edition this past November, has almost sold more copies in the last four months than it did during the six or seven years until the first edition went out of print. Of course, those sales pale in comparison to the numbers sold by the opportunist Bishop of Munich, one Reinhold Marx, whose decision to entitle his own book, Das Kapital, <laughs> had the effect of shooting it up to the top of the bestseller list. <laughs> This book actually appears to be a rather traditional corporatist Catholic appeal to class harmony in the face of the current capitalist crisis. But even this is a measure of the crisis of neoliberal ideology that attends the current moment. For me personally, a further measure of what was going on came when my old alma mater, the London School of Economics, long short of its radical heritage, where today not a single course on Marxism is taught, after having been turned into an expensive dis dispenser of MBAs under the tutelage of the intellectual guru of social democracy's third way, Tony Giddens, invited me, along with David Harvey and Meghnad Desai, to do a turn there last November on revisiting Marxism. And even more astonishing, the liberal Washington, D.C. establishment magazine, Foreign Policy, tracked me down last week and asked me to write an essay for them on what would Marx say today. I was sure they would never actually publish what I sent them, but they've gone gaga over it and are running it in the next issue. Now the irony of all this, or maybe it's the explanation in my case, is that a good many Marxists wouldn't consider me much of a Marxist at all. I well remember in the 1970s when my PhD thesis on incomes policy in Britain was published, the illustrious Marxist economist Lawrence Harris, well he was a Marxist then, he turned himself in the 90s into a a neoclassical economist, going out of his way back then to tell me it was a good book, but certainly not a Marxist one. So if I'm still a Marxist after all, it may well be because I've never lived in a country where Marxism was the official ideology, and there was therefore no official Marxist authority to deprive me of the label. Otherwise, my fate might have been like that unfortunate fellow in the famous Polish communist joke. He meets a friend one on, on the street one day who says he heard that he'd been expelled from the party. What happened, he asks. What did you do? Well, he says, first they warned me, and then they severely reprimanded me, and then they finally expelled me. Why? What did you do? Well, one day I was walking down the street just like this, and I bumped into the local party secretary. And he said, how are you, comrade? And I said, not very well. I had a very strange dream last night. What did you dream? I dreamt of a mountain of butter, and sitting on top of the mountain was God. The local party secretary said, Comrade, don't you know that God doesn't exist? And I said, what about butter? <laughs> For this I was warned. And then what happened? Well then, uh, I was done the honor of being asked to decorate the hall for the party congress that was being held in our town. I went and got posters of Marx and Engels and Lenin and Stalin and Mao, and I put them up on the hall. Party secretary walked in and said, take that bastard off the wall. I said, which one? <laughs> For that, I was severely reprimanded. And then what happened? Well, then they finally expelled me. Why? Well, again, I was walking down the street, and again, I bumped into the local party secretary. And he said, why weren't you at the last party meeting? I said, oh, if I had known it was the last one, I definitely <laughs> Now, as it happens, I've never been a member of any group. The social democratic ones like the NDP, having accommodated themselves to capitalism under the illusion that the state had chained capitalism with the Keynesian welfare state, always seemed too boring and staid. Liberals in a hurry, as Tom Naylor once called them. And not in too much of a hurry at that. The communist parties had a legacy of strategic adherence to the Kremlin and to its sanctioned official Marxism that they couldn't shape. As Schumpeter once said, there would have been as much affinity between Marx and the Kremlin as between Jesus and the Vatican. 
<laughs> My generation became Marxist not because of the example of the Soviet Union, but despite it. Moreover, unlike others of my generation who also became Marxist against the Stalinist example, I was never attracted to the Leninist form of party organization, as were those of my generation who joined Trotsky's party. Not only the practice of democratic centralism, but even the attempt to keep alive the language of the Bolshevik Revolution seemed awkward to me. I was sometimes tempted to go along to some of their meetings where I knew I would be recruited, but I was always afraid of being embarrassed by not knowing all the verses to the Internationale. This is not to say that I didn't see the need for a political party. I admired the organizing skills and the cadre-like dedication that the activists learned in these parties. And I've been actively involved for most of my adult life in repeated attempts to lay the basis for a post-social democratic, post-Leninist socialist party that would play this role creatively in our time. The failure to establish such a party is one of the main failures of my generation of Marxists. So what did me make, to come, make me come to think of myself as a Marxist and why do I still do so? I very well remember when Sam and I were becoming such close friends and so politically and theoretically attuned at the University of Manitoba, whispering to him in the library during the second year there, after reading Marx's preface to the critique of political economy, I think I'm a Marxist. <laughs> but in fact, the teleology of the preface, the notion of a succession of modes of production developing within the other, with socialism being nurtured within and then inevitably bursting out from within capitalism, didn't come to play much of a role in my thinking. Nor did what seemed to attract most economists to Marxism, a theory of crisis in terms of capitalism's inherent tendencies to stagnation and or overaccumulation that proved that capitalism had outlived its best before date. I'm not sure that this was Marx's theory, rather than those of those who came later and tried to explain both the imperialism that led to World War I and the Great Depression in this way. Convinced that the expansion during and after World War II was just a big blip, they became, he became rather good at predicting 28 of capitalism's last two crises. But it seemed to me they had lost Marx's understanding of the continuing dynamic of capitalism. This is a point I will come back to shortly. For my part, I also took from Marx, as they did, the notion that crises should not be seen as an incidental disruption of a natu naturally harmonious system, one always tending to equilibrium, which is what is taught in our economics department, but rather as emerging out of capitalism's systemic contradictions and market irrationalities. At the same time, however, I believe it was a mistake to interpret Marx by looking at capitalism primarily in terms of it permanently being on the verge of crisis, unable to grow sufficiently to generate or realize enough profits, much less to see crises as signaling capitalism's final breakdown so that all we have to do is wait and pick up the pieces. That crises diverge, emerge in diverse ways as periodic episodes that rise out of the dynamic, uneven, conflictual de historical development of capitalism seems to me evident. And that capitalism has the capacity to resolve crises, at least depending on the nature and scale of the political struggle against it, also seems to me evident. In this sense, capitalist economic crises do not automatically translate into political crises, precisely because the political is not a mere reflection of the economic. And even when political and economic crises do coincide chronologically, this does not mean that the state has lost the capacity to reproduce capitalist hegemony. Whether this is so or not also depends on the nature and scope of the anti-capitalist political struggle. I think that Marx can be interpreted in this way. If he can't, then I think he needs to be revised. What drew me most to Marxism as a young intellectual was the exciting developments taking place in the Marxist theory of the state. Building on, but revising and going well beyond Marx, 
in terms of understanding the capitalist nature of the modern state, its inherent ties, and yet its relative autonomy in relation to the capitalist class. What disturbs me most about those who insist we need to take our political inspiration today from the New Deal regulatory state or the social democratic Keynesian welfare state is their failure to understand what was already apparent in the 1960s. Anthony Crossland's The Future of Socialism, first published in 1956, famously encapsulated the thinking of a whole generation of social democratic leaders and intellectuals in Western capitalist countries, with the argument that the post-war transformation of capitalism had once and for all proved the Marxist analysis of capitalism wrong. According to Crossland, the post-war world had witnessed three fundamental <coughs> changes one, the capitalist class had lost its commanding position vis-a-vis -vis governments. Two, there had been a decisive shift of class power towards the working class at the expense of business. And three, there was a fundamental change in the nature of the business class, whereby the economic power of capital markets and banks were much weaker. Marx had been greatly relevant to understanding the world Crossland wrote until the Second World War. After it, he was not. Notably, Crossland refused to adopt what he called the current fashion of sneering at Marx. Marx, in his view, was a towering giant among socialist thinkers whose work made the classical economists look flat, pedestrian, and circumscribed by comparison. Only moral dwarfs or people devoid of imagination sneer at men like that. I thought of that moral dwarf image when I read Bob Ray's review. <laughs> that said, Crossland was convinced that Marx's writings had little or nothing to offer to the contemporary socialists because they related to conditions that had long since passed. Yet it has long been obvious that what Crossland took as the fundamental condition of the post-war world were in fact temporary illusions. It was already obvious to me in the 60s that this was the case. This was based on personal experience. My dad sitting in the kitchen at the table crying in the late 1950s when I got home from high school because he'd been laid off again. My mother at her literal despair when this meant she had to forego the family wage and go back to work as a night cleaner in a bank. The reforms they had fought for as members of the CCF made a real difference in their lives, but it did not change their place in the fundamental class relations of a capitalist society. And I saw this more objectively in my observations as an economic student of how dependent the Keynesian welfare state was on capital accumulation for the reforms it introduced for how it tailored those reforms so as not to get in the way of capital accumulation. In almost every respect, reading the analysis of the Communist Manifesto, even in the 60s, was more relevant and less anachronistic than reading Crossland's text, written over a century later. But what was really exciting about being drawn into the intellectual effort of developing new Marxist concepts especially in terms of a class analysis that sought to reveal the growth of a new working class and a new middle class in modern capitalism, was that that also allowed for the development of a state theory that refuted a, base, a crude base superstructure model, that developed an understanding how even the welfare state was structured to reproduce capitalist social relations, and that helped us understand the contradictions that were undermining that state. It helped us understand the forces that produced the crisis of the 70s, and it helped us see that unless a way was found to build on the reforms, to transform the state, and finally take capital's control over the economy into the democratic public domain, those reforms would be lost in the wake of the crisis of the 70s. We were very aware that our intellectual labors could only take us so far in this respect. As I put it in the preface to the Canadian state in 1977, one must, of course, cautiously avoid the illusion that by virtue of its strengths, 
a Marxist theory of the state will gain prominence. The rise and falls of theories is not merely the product of intellectual competition with the most fruitful coming out on top. The acceptance of any particular theory and its conceptual elements rests on some consensus amongst intellectuals with regard to the importance of the significant problems theory identifies. On the identification of those problems, questions of interest as well as objectivity, ideological hegemony as well as academic freedom will inevitably play their part. Most important of all will be the question of whether the generation of Marxist theory will itself continue to be divorced from the working classes in Canada. For without working classes hoping, helping to identify the significant problems by their own actions and taking up cultural as well as political and economic struggle by re-examining its own history and developing a theory and practice for future change, Marxist theory will lack a social base, which is finally the sine qua non for the sustenance of any body of ideas. And understanding this, is, I think, why we weren't so blindsided by the neoliberal reaction that came in the 1980s. We could see the consequences of the defeat of trade unionism, and we could see that what was going on had nothing to do with markets being freed from states. We could see, rather, that states, and especially the American imperial state, which had led the project of making a global capitalism since 1945, were the leading agents in the expansion of markets across the globe and into every facet of life. Our Marxist concept helped us avoid the impoverished, empty categories of states versus markets, from neo borrowed from neoclassical economics and Weberian sociology, whereby social democrats and liberals adopted these categories and only inverted their values so as to say that states can be good for markets rather than bad for and our Marxist concept also helped us in terms of understanding today's crisis and the state's involvement in trying to contain it. I must say, however, that insofar as the resurgence of interest in Marxism today is mainly about an impression that Marxist economists correctly anticipated this crisis, I am not so impressed. Marxist economic explanations of this crisis in terms of stagnation tendencies, the falling rate of profit, or the overaccumulation of capital, fail to recognize the extent to which neoliberalism effectively resolved the crisis of the 1970s via the defeat of trade unionism and facilitating free trade and free capital movements, as well as industrial and state restructuring, thereby creating the space for the incredibly dynamic and expansive capitalism of the past quarter century. Nor am I so impressed by others who predicted the crisis for other wrong reasons. Above all, in terms of the trade imbalances in the global economy and the inflow of funds to the United States from countries with a trade surplus to cover the U.S. trade deficit. As though they were doing the United States a favor rather than participating in the circuits of global capital as those circuits pass through Wall Street and Washington, D.C. Those who imagine that the crisis would come from China or Japan pulling out their investments in U.S. Treasury bonds could not have been more wrong. And although it began in August 2007 as a financial crisis in the United States, any illusions of the rest of the world decoupling from the American economy in this crisis have been shattered by the immediate spread of the U.S. financial crisis to Europe and very soon around the globe. And then, by capital flowing more than ever into the safety of U.S. Treasury bond. The current economic crisis has its roots in the dynamics and contradictions of finance, which became very real indeed in, the, in contemporary capitalism as finance developed in the second half of the 20th century. Even though finance and production are obviously linked today more than ever, the origins of today's U.S.-based financial crisis was not rooted in the failures of the so-called real economy or its imbalances, but in its contributions, finances contributions, to capitalism's successes. 
There were two fundamental processes through which finance played such a crucial role. The spatial extension of capitalism was facilitated by finance hedging and spreading risks associated with the global integration of investment production and trade. Providing risk insurance for production in a complex global economy without which accumulation would otherwise have been significantly restricted in the last quarter century. At the same time, the deepening of capitalism socially in the second half of the 20th century involved the massive integration of subordinate classes into the financial dimensions of capitalist social relations through private pensions, consumer credit, and mortgages for private housing. In this way, finance became greatly important to facilitating the maintenance of demand in the context of the consolidation of the defeat of trade unionism the limits placed on collective service provisions in the welfare state, and the enormous increase in class inequality since the 1970s. Finance was more generally functional to the dynamism of capitalism in the neoliberal era by mobilizing cheap global credits for the U.S. economy, sustaining its role as the prime consumer for the global economy. And the central role of the U.S. dollar and treasury bonds as the key store of value and the basis for all other calculations of value. And the global institutional predominance of U.S. financial institutions acted as a vortex, drawing the global surplus to American financial markets and instruments. If Marx were observing the downturn today, I think he would relish pointing out the flaws inherent in the capitalism that led to this crisis. But he would marvel, not just carp, at how modern speculative developments in finance, such as slicing and dicing and repackaging and reselling bank loans through securitization and derivatives, allowed markets to spread the risks of global in integration. He would understand that without those financial innovations, capital accumulation, including through the development of the microchip, the, the communications revolution, and the genome revolution we're just about to live through would have been significantly reduced. And he would not fail to notice that so would it have been reduced if finance had not penetrated more and more deeply into society. But he would also have discerned that the result at the same time has been the consumer demand in recent years has depended more and more on credit cards and mortgage debt and that the defeats of trade unionism, the cutbacks in social welfare, made people more vulnerable to market shocks. This leveraged, volatile, global financial system contributed to overall capitalist economic growth in recent decades, but it also produced a series of inevitable financial bubbles. The most dangerous bubble appeared in the U.S. housing sector. Its subsequent bursting had such a profound impact precisely because of that particular bubble's centrality to both sustaining U.S. consumer demand and international financial markets. Marx would no doubt point to this crisis as a perfect instance of when capitalism looks like, the famous quotation, the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spell but he would not dismiss thereby the powers of the sorcerer, as most of those do who see capitalism as having been weak for the last 30 or 40 or 50 years. So if the current interest in Marx has only to do with economic crises, when faith in neoliberal orthodoxies has imploded, this does not please me so much. We should not forget that in 1998, on the 150th anniversary of the publication of the Communist Manifesto, Marx was also much quoted, but that time for his prescience in predicting capitalist globalization. The era of globalization we were living through was indeed a constant reminder of the essential meaning of the Manifesto's designation of the bourgeoisie as revolutionary. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production, and thereby relations of production, and with them the whole relations of society. It compels all nations 
on point of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst, i.e. to become bourgeois themselves. In one word, it creates a world after its own image. But what made Marx so different from the boosters of capitalist globalization in his time and in ours was not only that he accurately identified and, visibly and vividly described the alienation and exploitation of so much of humanity in the process, but that he also sought to identify and understand the underlying contradictory dynamics that would interrupt this process. He thus understood that the need for a constantly expanding market which chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe has the consequence of paving the way for more extensive and exclusive, exhaustive crises. This included in our time the way financial crises both exacerbate and are exacerbated by crises in production. And along the way, Marx perceptively identified what he called the political illusion as well as the woeful inadequacies of those who argue that this could be permanently prevented through mere reform of the existing system. Not that he ever thought changing the system fundamentally would be easy. Marx knew very well that a developing capitalism that leaves no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment, one that again and again dissolves old social reforms and leaves societies mired in what he called the icy water of egotistical calculation, is also a capitalism that fosters social isolation. It is this social isolation that creates passivity in the face of the personal crises that people experience when they face the closure of their factories or offices and the foreclosure of their homes. And it is this social isolation that impedes the formation of collective movements to bring about real change. Marx thought that he saw that isolation being overcome through the unions and parties developing in his time among the working classes that capitalism had just brought into being. This is what he was referring to in the manifesto when he wrote of the immediate aim being the organization of the proletarians into a class whose first task would be to win the battle of democracy. And here's the main point. Despite the depth of the current crisis, Marx would have had no illusion that economic crises in and of themselves bring about change. Organization and movement building are also needed. Marx would not take for granted that communities of active and foreign citizens are ready and waiting to take up radical alternatives to capitalism. The first question that Marx would have today is how to overcome the increasing social isolation of people in capitalist societies, which makes them passively accept layoffs and foreclosures. He would encourage the formation of new collective identities, associations, and institutions within which people could resist the status quo and begin to decide how to fulfill their needs in better ways than capitalist markets allow for. No such ambitious vision for enacting change has arisen from the crisis so far. And it is this void that Marx would find most troubling of all. In the United States, some recent attention-getting proposals only appear to be radical because they go beyond what the left of the Democratic Party is now prepared to advocate. Dean Baker, co-director of the Center for Economic Policy Research in Washington, D.C., for example, the leading spokesman uh, of a radical nature on financial matters in the states, has called for a $2 million cap on Wall Street salaries and the enactment of a financial transaction tax, which would impose an incremental fee on the sale or transfer of stocks, bonds, and other financial assets. Marx would view this proposal as a perfect case of thinking inside the box explicitly endorsing, while even limiting, the very things that are identified as the problem. Marx would be no less derisive of those who think that back bank nationalizations, such as those that took place in Sweden and Japan during the, their financial crises in the early and late 90s, respectively, 
whereby the state cleansed the banks of their bank bad debts and then reprivatized them would amount to real change. Ironically, one of the most radical proposals making the rounds today, much discussed in the Financial Times of all places, has come from an economist at the London School of Economics, William Boyder, a former member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, and certainly no Marxist, who has proposed that the whole financial sector should be turned into a public utility. Since banks in the contemporary world cannot exist with public deposit insurance, and require public central banks to act as lenders of last resort. There is no case, he argues, for their continuing existence as privately owned, profit-seeking institutions. Banks should be publicly owned and run as public services. This echoes the demand for the centralization of credit in the hands of the state that Marx himself made in the manifesto. And to his mind, this reinforced the case he made for the importance of the working classes winning the battle of democracy, to radically change that state from an organ imposed upon society to one responsive to it. From financialization of the economy to the socialization of finance, Buter wrote in his blog in the Financial Times website, a small step for the lawyers, a huge step for mankind. <laughs> Clearly, you don't have to be a Marxist to have radical aspirations. You do, however, have to be some sort of a Marxist to recognize that even at a time like this, when the capitalist class is on its heels, demoralized and confused, radical change is not likely to start as a small step for lawyers. Presumably after they get all the stakeholders to sit down together in a room to sign a document or two. Marx would tell you that without the development of popular class forces through radical new movements and parties, this kind of really radical proposal for the socialization of finance must fall on infertile ground. Notably, during the economic crisis of the 1970s, radical forces inside many of European, Europe's social democratic and labor parties put forward similar proposals. But they were unable to get their leaders, the leaders of those parties, to go along with such reforms. Those leaders derided these proposals as old-fashioned. Attempts to talk seriously about the need to democratize our economies in such radical ways were largely shunted aside not only by neoliberals, but also by social democrats and postmodernists for the next two or three decades. We are still paying for the marginalization of such ideas. The irrationality built into the basic logic of capitalist markets, so deftly analyzed by Marx, is once again evident. Sauf qui peut, each firm lays off workers and tries to pay less to those kept on. Undermining job security has the effect of undercutting demand throughout the economy. As Marx knew, micro-rational behavior has the worst macro-rational outcome. We can now see we're ignoring Marx while trusting in Adam Smith's hidden hand gets you. The crisis today also exposes irrationalities in realms well beyond finance. One example is the widespread call for trading in carbon credits as a solution to the climate crisis. This supposedly progressive proposal whereby corporations that meet emission standards sell credits to others that don't meet their own targets is problematic because it depends on volatile derivative markets that are inherently open to manipulation and to credit crashes. Marx would insist that to find solutions to the global problems of climate change, we need to break with the logic of capitalist markets rather than use state institutions to reinforce them, as the carbon credit proposal seeks to do. He would call for the nationalization of the auto industry and all its component supplier parts and its planned conversion into an industry that not only produces cars that run on hydrogen or electricity, as well as mass transit vehicles, but also engages in the planned conversion of that industry so that it produces solar panels. Of course, Marx would also call for international economic solidarity rather than economic competition among states in this process. As he put it in the manifesto, united action of the leading countries, at least as the first condition 
for the emancipation of the proletariat. Yet the work of building new institutions and movements for change must begin at home. Though he called for workers of the world to unite, Marx still insisted that the workers in each country first of all settle things with their own bourgeoisie. The measures required to transform existing economic, political, and legal institutions would, of course, as he put it, be different for different countries. But in every case, Marx would insist that the way to bring about radical change was first to get people in each country to think ambitiously again. How is that likely to happen? Even at a moment when the financial crisis that began in the U.S. has led to a general economic crisis that is bleeding dry a vast swathe of the world's people, the future prognosis is uncertain. If you were alive today, Marx perhaps would not look to pinpoint exactly when or how the current crisis would end, but rather would point out that such crises are part and parcel of capitalism's continued dynamic existence. Reformist politicians who think that they can do away with the inherent class inequalities and recurrent crises of capitalist society are the real romantics of our day themselves clinging, clinging to a naive utopian vision of what the world might be like without the fundamental changes in social relations and the full democratization of economic as well as political life that Marx saw as necessary to transform capitalism. If the current crisis has demonstrated one thing, it is that Marx was the greater realist. That is why he insisted on the need for a much more ambitious vision and agenda for the type of change you really need, if you can believe in it. This must involve the kind of political activism that works hard at developing both the institutional and popular capacities to make real change possible. And to this end, was Marx's vision of socialism all about? As he put it, when as a young man he was engaged in turning Hegel on his head, Socialism is not a state of affairs which is to be established, not an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself, but the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. Like every revolutionary, Marx wanted to see the revolution in his lifetime, but capitalism had plenty of life in it. And he could only glimpse, however perceptively, at the mistakes, let alone the wrong terms, that socialist movements, both those that eventually made revolutions and those which didn't, would commit. The point of still being a Marxist today lies in taking seriously what Marx meant when he wrote in the 18th Brumaire that the goal has to be to recover the spirit of the revolution, as he, as he put it, not merely to set its ghost walking about again. The point is not to return to Marx in order to convince ourselves again that history is on our side and that capitalism, this time, has really reached its expiry date. Still less to think that the old parties of the working class can be revived as viable agents of change. And even less still to look to the ex-communist leaders of Russia, Eastern Europe, and China to admit their folly in opting for global capitalism. Nor is it to imagine that the proletariat, as Marx knew it, is now finally going to be forced by this crisis to rediscover its revolutionary vocation, as firmly establish the dictatorship of the proletariat, and smash the state. None of this way of thinking is very helpful. What is helpful is to realize that the opportunity is there for people to organize, still using a class map, even if not the same one that Marx used to build new institutions through which they can develop the capacities to determine better their collective needs and to democratize the state and the economy. We do need to relearn from Marx that movements for protest are not enough and that societies can really be changed without contesting for state power since this is where class power is concentrated and reproduced. And while we may gain insight and courage from reading his essay on the Paris Commune, we also need to go beyond his concepts of a state in transition to figure out how to avoid co-optation on the one hand or socialist dictatorship on the other. 
to finally put in process a means whereby state power is actually about using the resources of the state to empower and develop, develop the self-governing capacities of people. Does still being a Marxist mean that one is sure this is going to be realized? Not at all. I would even say the odds are against it. Even though I am pretty sure that we are going to see plenty of renewed class struggles, the building of new socialist movements, and the rekindling of revolutionary ambitions in the 21st century. But we can only impoverish our own spirit if we stand aside and try to contribute to it, whatever the odds. Thank you. Perfect.